In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false teacher named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn them, try to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now, the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist, dark, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for, the teaching, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them and returned to Jerusalem. From Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the, Sabbath, on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak up. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. They shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So the uh, title of today's message is A Light for the Gentiles. So the key verse is verse 47. The subtitle is the first part of Paul's first evangelical uh, journey. So from chapter 13, there will be a three evangelical journey by Paul mainly, and then Paul's visit to Rome as a final chapter. And today is the, the very first one. In the last passage, we learned that the Jerusalem church earnestly prayed to God for Peter, who had been unjustly imprisoned. God answered their prayer by sending his angel to rescue Peter from prison. So through earnest prayer, the early Christian overcame persecution. And then the word of God continued to spread and flourish. So we really learn, like them, we also must pray honestly and continually because our God answers our honest prayer. Even sometimes when we don't fully believe for what we pray for. And today in chapter 13, the Antioch church obeys the Holy Spirit and send out Barnabas and Saul as the first missionaries. They begin in Cyprus, as you see this, uh, the, the, the map, they, the Cyprus the, the, the island, and then uh, go to the Pis, uh, Pisidian Antioch. This is a different Antioch, not uh, Syrian Antioch, the northern uh, Pisidian area. 
during this mission journey, we can see very dynamic work of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and very clear gospel message. Most of all, through this mission journey, Barnabas and Saul accepted God's calling for the Gentiles. Based on Isaiah 49, 6b, uh, this is today's key verse, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It is very significant that God made Barnabas and Saul a light for the Gentiles. So they became the first representative missionaries for the uh, Gentiles. And we have to know that it is not only for them. Now anyone who believed in Jesus and loved Jesus and wants to follow him is called the light of the world. As Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 14. So the main point of this calling is to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. So through today's passage, I want to pray that we may learn two things. Let's learn what it means to be a light for the Gentiles. And then how? How to live with this most precious privilege? First, the Antioch church becomes a missionary sending church. Also, I will show you because this is a little bit lengthy passage, but we have very four points. So first, the Antioch church becomes a missionary sending church one through three. In chapter 13, we find the Antioch church has matured to the point of sending missionaries. Do you remember this is the first Gentile church? And then they sent the first missionaries. Then how did this happen? In the first place, they studied the Bible very diligently. Look at verse 1. So now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaen, who had brought up with Herod the Tetra, and then Saul. When the Antioch church began, there were only two renowned Bible teachers, Barnabas and Saul. But now they had five influential Bible teachers, including a prophet. When we see three other names, it seems all, uh, they all have a different background. Like Simeon called Niger, meaning black, seems, to, uh, seems like he is from Africa. And uh, Lucius of Cyrene may have been a pioneer who first shared the gospel with the Greeks in Antioch. And his Latin name, Lucius, indicates a Roman influence. And then Menaen had been brought up with the Herod, the Tetra, indicating that he must have been very privileged person, a very high social rank. And this diverse group who had a different background worked together in one spirit to serve God. With such beautiful co-working, when they taught the word of God to Antioch church members, God blessed them to grow mature enough to send missionaries. Uh, in the second place, they devote themselves to fasting prayer, seeking God's guidance and direction. Look at verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and the fasting, and Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. While they were uh, worshiping the Lord, and then they uh, did the fasting prayer, Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. As you know, fasting prayer is the best example of humility and dependence on God alone, seeking God's will, direction, guidance upon our lives, often uh, requesting our urgent prayer topics. So as the Antioch church grew more and more, they must have sought God's guidance for their direction. Then the Holy Spirit told them to set apart Barnabas and Saul. So God's direction for the Antioch church was to become missionary sending church. It is uh, expanding. So this was exactly the same direction as the one which the 12 disciples of Jesus received from risen Jesus in Acts 1a. So this is the key verse of the whole Acts. 
it says, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Our human fallen nature wants to stay in comfort zone. We don't want to expand a lot. But those who receive the Holy Spirit are called to deny themselves, take up Jesus' given cross daily, and follow him. So we always need to uh, break our narrow self-centered mindset and enlarge our heart to embrace God's heart to reach out to others. In the third place, they obey the direction of the Holy Spirit. To them, sending Barnabas and Saul, who had been their teachers and pastors, must have their heart. But how do they respond? Look at verse 3. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands uh, on them and sent them off. Here, they really obey the Holy Spirit prayerfully and immediately. The second, the Holy Spirit raised Paul as the mission leader, verse 4 through 14. So look at verses 4 and 5. Barnabas and Saul sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down Seleucia, and then from there they sailed from there to Cyprus, the island, the Mediterranean Sea, island. And when they arrived the first city, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. And then they didn't stay long. And then they traveled through the whole island, crossed the island, and came to Paphos. So there, there were Sergius Paulus, the proconsul. He's like a governor, an intelligent man. He sent them Barnabas and so. Though he was a man of position, he was a, a very thirsty soul longing for God's work. So it was a, a great opportunity for God's ministry in Peppers. However, Elimus, the sorcerer, who was the attendant of the proconsul, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from, from the face. So he acted like an enemy of the gospel. Then what happened? Look at verses 9 through 11. Saul, who was also called Paul. So notice that from here, his name is changed to Paul. And Saul means, I am great. Paul means, I am small. He became very humble. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus, and said, you, a child of a devil, and an enemy of everything that is right, you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hands of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time not even able to see the light of the sun. And then immediately, mist and darkness came over him. And then he, he groped about, seeking someone to uh, lead him by hand. So here, notice that Paul very strongly rebuked the enemy of the Lord, not by his own power, but empowered by the Holy Spirit. God honored Paul's face and his fighting spirit. So immediately, Elimas became blind, as Paul said. When the proconsul saw what had happened in Elimas, he believed, because he was amazed at the teaching about the law. It is for sure he was, a, because he was a very influential man, his conversion could be great impact to that city, the purpose. And let's move on to verse 13. Now look at closely at verse 13. So verse 13 says, from Peppers, Paul and his companions sailed. Uh, they took the ship and they sailed to Roga in Pamphylia. And then where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Here John is the, another name is Mark. He wrote the, this Mark's gospel. He joined the, this mission team in chapter 12, the last verse from Jerusalem. And then when he moved to Paul Polga, he didn't want to continue to uh, join them. He just left. So here, notice that until now, the mission team has been known as Barnabas. The Barnabas came first, and then so. It means Barnabas was the leader. But from now on, it is known as Paul and his companion, and or Paul and Barnabas. 
the leadership of the mission has transferred from Barnabas to Paul. Perhaps this transition maybe led John Mark, because John was a cousin of Barnabas, returned to Jerusalem. He really liked to follow his elder cousin Barnabas. Also, he might have been frightened by Paul's very fighting spirit. Uh, we don't know clear reason, but it was a, a great discouragement to the team. So to the team, his leaving was a painful event. Anyway, they moved on and arrived in Pisidian Antioch. We must know that the missionary work is a spiritual battle with the devil. So spiritual leaders must stand on God's side with a pure gospel of faith, even though there is some pain, but still we have to stand on God's side with a clear gospel faith rather than any other human relationship. So let's move on to the third, the next slide, third, where Paul's gospel message in Pisidian Antioch, 15 through 41. On the Sabbath, Paul and Barnabas entered the synagogue and he sat down. After the reading from the law and the uh, prophet, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have a word for exhortation for the people, please speak. Paul seized this opportunity. Standing up, motioned with his hand, he began to speak. And Paul had a very keen sense of God's history. And he had a clear gospel message. Now, this is a lengthy passage, but in his message, we can find three main points. So look at uh, one by one. So in the first place, God sent the savior of the world from the line of David. In verses 17 through 23, Paul uh, briefly summarized the history of Israel, starting from God's choice of their ancestors, and then their descendant prosperity in Egypt, and then Exodus, and then God's endurance of their conduct for around 40 years in the wilderness, and then conquering the seven nations in Canaan. After this, God's repeated deliverance through judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. And then when the people of Israel asked for a king, God gave them Saul, a son of Kish, the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. And then after leaving Saul, God made the shepherd boy David their king. And then he testified about him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. So all the Israelites, including the Gentiles who converted to Judaism, knew very well that Messiah would come from the line of David. And this knowledge particularly was most important to them because they longed for the Messianic kingdom like the King David's kingdom. And, and now Paul emphasized that Jesus is the very promised Messiah who came from the line of David. In verse 23, he said, from this man, David, descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Next, in the second place, look at verses 26 and 27. He says, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Israel and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfill the words of the prophet that are read every Sabbath. They were actually reading every Sabbath. Jesus the Messiah was not the Messiah that most of the people of Israel had expected. So they rejected and they condemned him to die on the cross. But what an amazing mystery it is. They are condemning Jesus by asking Pilate to have him executed was to fulfill the words of the prophet that are read every service by them. Since there was no proper ground in Jesus for a death sentence, Jesus' death looked most tragic in terrible injustice. But in actuality, it was not. It was the fulfillment of the prophecy that the Messiah would come as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus' death was to save men, you and, you and me, from their sins. Ultimately, he died to obey his father 
and fulfill God's will for the world's salvation. God raised Jesus from the dead and made him the Lord and the Messiah. This religion Jesus was seen by his 12 apostles and many others. And they became his eyewitnesses to all the Israelites. So next in the third place, Jesus' resurrection brings the forgiveness of sins and justification to all who believe. When Paul shared the good news of Jesus' resurrection, he quoted three verses from Old Testament, Psalm 27, Isaiah 55, 3, and then Psalm 16, 10. As you know, around the half of the Psalms were written by whom? By David. And most of the contents he wrote can be applied to himself. But these three verses, particularly uh, verse 16, 10, you will not let your Holy One see decay, cannot be applied to David. Because after David served God's purpose in his own generation, he died and his body was buried and decayed. So Psalm 1610 was not prophesying about David, but it was prophesying about the Messiah's resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was the clearest evidence that he is the Son of God, who conquered even death, removing the penalty of all our sin. So in verses 38, 39, Paul's final conclusion is this, uh, 38, 39, by believing in Jesus, now we are found not guilty in God's holy court because Jesus paid it all. What an amazing grace and wonderful good news this is. By facing in Jesus, we can now stand firm before God as his holy children without fear. In verses 40 and 41, Paul adds a warning by quoting Habakkuk 1.5. Those who scoff at the message of salvation in Jesus will perish. So lastly, first, God makes his servant a light for the Gentiles, 42 through 52. The people of Pisidian Antioch were deeply touched by Paul's message. They, so they invited him to speak again on the next Sabbath. When the congregation was dismissed, Many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas talked with them and urged them to continue to remain in the grace of God. So what an amazing work of God here. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. So indeed, there were people whose souls were open and so thirsty to hear the life-giving message of the gospel. However, when so many people were excited and became interested in hearing life-giving message, there were some unhappy Jews. They were filled with jealousy. It was a painful moment. Paul and Barnabas had brought the life-giving and changing gospel to the Jews, but some of the Jews rejected it. And not only so, they became the enemy of the gospel. So to them, how did Paul and Barnabas respond? Look at verse 46 and 47. So Paul and Barnabas was painful, but not discouraged. They saw this Jesus sadly as the proverbial, proverbial swine. You know, the swine did not deserve the precious pearls of eternal life. It is very sad. At the same time, they saw the Gentiles as the precious children of God. So instead of being discouraged, they found God's direction based on God's word and uh, pressed on forward through the open door to Gentile ministry. John chapter 8, 12, Jesus himself testified about himself. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Ultimately speaking, who is the light? Jesus. Jesus is the light for the Gentiles who has lived in darkness without knowing God. Jesus reveals God's love for the Gentiles. Jesus reveals God's forgiveness to Gentiles. Jesus reveals God's amazing peace, which this world can never take away to the Gentiles. So when we have this Jesus in our hearts, 
Jesus makes us alive for the Gentiles. So one time Jesus told his disciples in Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 14, you, you are the light of the world. So I put this picture of the sun and moon and how moon can shine the light. Do you know the, how it works? The moon never shines by itself. It cannot. It has to receive the light from the sun. Exactly in the same way, the disciples should receive the light from Jesus to shine the light. Otherwise, we cannot be light. When we recognize ourselves as a light for the Gentiles, we are not discouraged by the rejection. Instead, we are really happy with God's high calling. And we can see all kinds of different people as precious children of God. So you are all very, very precious children of God. With God's great hope for world salvation. Then let's think about then who? Who are the Gentiles today for us? Anyone who does not know God and Jesus personally yet, regardless of his or her human condition or background, he or she is a Gentile. So he or she can be your friend, your fellow colleague at your workplace, or your family members. So to all of these people, we must reveal the love of God and saving grace of Jesus by sharing the gospel with them through words, through deeds, and through good influences. Will there be rejection and persecution? Yes, for sure. However, the greatest joy and deepest meaning for any human being is to be a light for the Gentiles. So conclusion today, we learn that the Holy Spirit chooses. Actually, we cannot volunteer by ourselves. The Holy Spirit chooses and uses whom? Those who love Jesus for his world salvation purpose. So those who are willing to have Jesus in our hearts for his world salvation purpose. The Holy Spirit choose them and use them. And those who share the gospel are truly the light for the Gentiles. There will be for sure persecution and there will be rejection in gospel ministry. However, we have to remember that there are always God prepared people whose hearts are open and thirsty for the gospel. So let's pray that God may bless us and each of us as a light for the Gentiles. So the final one, the big idea, God chooses and uses those who love Jesus as the light for the Gentiles.